Hello everyone, welcome to the second lecture of the introduction to scientific computing. If you already installed your development environment, then skip to this time code. If you're still having trouble, um, stay tuned, we're gonna set up the system from the blank install of Windows. We're gonna use uh, Microsoft Edge and we'll go to sigwin.com. From there, we will download the Sigwin installer for Windows. Run the installer. Next, install from internet. Uh, keep the default root directory. Next, next. Uh, just pick any mirror you'd like. Mm, doesn't matter. <clears throat> um, we're going to go into the view full list and we will search for Fortran. The package we're looking for is called GCC Fortran. And in the third column, instead of uh, skip, change it to the latest version. In my case, it's 11.2.0-1. Um, there is two other packages that we're going to install. We will use, um, we will find make. Same uh, process. Uh, find make, um, get the latest version. Finally, um, we will just try um, GCC. The package you are looking for is GCC-G++. And similarly, we're going to put the latest version. So click Next. Next again. And we're going to wait until uh, this package is download and install. Let's continue. Um, we're going to click Finish. There should be a shortcut now on the desktop, uh, saying Sigwin64 Terminal. We're going to run it. I'm going to increase the font size just a little bit. Notepad h.f90. This is going to be our file. Cannot find the file. Uh, do you want to create a new file? Yes. Um, program test print star comma hello from Windows and program test. Control S to save. Close the notepad window. G4 tran h dot f ninety minus o space hello dot xz list all right we have their executable now we're gonna run it by typing dot slash hello dot xz and there it goes um, we have a compiler um, we compiled the executable. Now time to set up the Eclipse IDE. So exit the Sigwin terminal. Let's go back to the browser. Eclipse.org. We will download the installer. Now we run the installer. It might take a while uh, on the first start because it uses Java, uh, so it loads quite a few components. In the installer, we will select the Eclipse IDE for scientific computing. Install in the default location. Let's continue. Click Launch. It may take a while for the first start. Uh, select a directory as workspace. We can choose the default one and uh, check the use this as the default and do not ask again. In the Eclipse IDE, we will we'll create a new uh, Fortran project. Um, executable GNU Fortran on Linux. We will um, call it project hello. If you just um, Try to build. There's actually no files right now. Um, we're going to need to add a Fortran source code. A new uh, Fortran source file. 
we'll call it h.f19 just as before here it already creates a few lines print um, hello from eclipse now if we try to build just at this very moment uh, there will be an error that looks like this uh, program make not found in path there is a way to fix it so we will go into the properties of the project we'll go into fortran build environment add a new variable called path and the value will be the path where Sigwin in is installed so that's uh, Sigwin 64 backslash bin we can check add to all configure that means it will add it to debug and release configurations apply and close try again to build and run What I didn't do um, before I built the program, I didn't save it. I will save and uh, run again. And now we have uh, hello from Eclipse. Okay, guys, so I just want to say that uh, installing Eclipse IDE is completely optional. Um, if you have access to G4 Trend Compiler, this is sufficient for the class. If you still have trouble, I have another final option for you. It's not for the faint hearted, so be prepared. Now, you can use the remote machine on campus by logging into that machine through a terminal. There is instructions on how to do that on this page. You can see it right here on the screen. There is instructions for Windows and we're going to do this from Linux. It kind of beats the purpose. Um, if you already have Linux installed, why would you log in into another Linux machine? But who knows, maybe you have a kind of Linux where you cannot, cannot use G4Tran or something doesn't work at your local computer. Maybe your local computer is too weak. Let's give it a try. It should be in the lab, uh, but I'm going to show it anyway. So, what we're going to do, we're going to log in to garfield.cs.mon.ca. Uh, through Linux, we're going to use the SS SSH command. So, SSH garfield.cs.mon.ca uh, minus L for the login and put your... Um, man login name it will ask for the password all right we're in um question is now what what can i do with this uh we're gonna try to see if g4 trend is installed and indeed there is a version of g4 trend we're gonna try to create our um hello world file using the nano editor and i'll use the same file name that i really like it's very short it will ask me if i want to save yes enter gfortran h.f19 output h compiles and there it is. So we were able to compile that file. Let's see what's on this remote machine. We can uh, list the directory with ls. We can run midnight commander, which interestingly is installed there. Um, what you can do, you can create an extra folder. 
uh, you can use uh, either midnight commander um, to create a folder for your Fortran files and put everything in here, or just use the root folder, uh, however you like. Uh, let's see what else we can find. I'm going to exit the midnight commander, or you can keep it running. Uh, we're going to see if there is CMake. Again, that's completely optional. Um, you don't need that for the cloud. Yes, there is indeed uh, a fairly new version of CMake. And uh, uh, finally, we can run a command you name dash A which will display some information about the system. So it shows the type of Linux kernel running. I hope uh, by now everybody has their systems set up and running. This is the main part of lecture two. And we will compute something with Fortran, finally. Now, um, computers these days are used for many different things. Uh, communication, entertainment, video, databases. In the past, they were intended as calculators. And still in science, this is what they're used for very often to calculate something, to crunch numbers. Fortran, it's a very interesting remnant of the past. It goes all the way from 1957 Fortran means formula translation, was intended as a tool to crunch numbers, to compute some formulas. And this is why it still exists. It serves its purpose really good. Now, of course, um, I cannot really give a very complicated problem. We need something simple uh, that everybody in this class will easily understand without their head exploding. Now, I thought about two options here. One would have something to do with number pi, like maybe calculate pi. And the other one was uh, something called euler mascheroni constant or euler mascheroni number. Uh, in the end, I think we can do both. Let's um, start with pi. Uh, while there exists a fairly efficient formula to, to compute pi, we will use the fairly inefficient way, uh, which is called the Basel problem. A Basel problem, it's, it's a series uh, of what's called the reciprocals of the squares. So it goes like 1 plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared and so on and so on. Uh, interestingly, this infinite series converges to pi squared over 6. Usually you learn about this in calculus. Um, there are several proofs. Mm, they use different areas of mathematics. Some use Fourier, some use Euler's formula, and so on and so on. You can read more about it on the Wikipedia page only if you're interested. The point is, if we take the series, compute the sum, we should get pi squared over 6. Now, uh, let's do this. We will first uh, start with Mathematica. We will just compute the value in decimal digits uh, of pi squared over 6, and it gives us 1.6449340. We'll remember this number. Let's experiment. We'll make a function. By the way, you don't need Mathematica. It's just a tool for me to show things. We will call a function Basel. Function of n, the number of terms that we will add up. Some going from um, 1 to any number n that we desire. And it will add up 1 over k squared terms. Now let's plot this function and see what it looks like graphically. All right, now it doesn't really tell us much. Uh, pi squared over 6, let's call it known result. And on the plot, I will also add that known result uh, constant. Our sum converges 
although it seems to converge fairly slowly, which is true. Right now we add up um, 100,000 terms. If we just want to get closer to our limit by one decimal digit, we'll need a million of n. And I'll calculate the limit of n going to infinity. And yes, it's pi squared over 6. Mathematica gives uh, this answer. Just calculate basal of 1000. Now, by the way, basal is not really a, a common um, terminology. And what we'll do, we'll ask for nine decimal digit. There you go. So um, let's do this in Fortran. Let's, let's calculate this sum. This will show several concepts about Fortran programming. Uh, the concepts will be variables loops, uh, formatting and printing. We will start by creating the start and the end of the program. To work with numbers, we need a placeholder for the numbers. So this will be variables. And one of the variables that we're trying to compute is the result. A feature of Fortran, uh, of Fortran compiler, is that whenever you just mention any variable, it automatically, implicitly creates one. And this um, is a source of error. So in the very far and distant past, um, somebody thought it was a good idea, but then they quickly realized, okay, so it's not a good idea because you make a mistake on typing a variable name and um, you get a, a lot of problems if you write something wrong by mistake. So there is a feature now, um, implicit none. It will prevent the compiler from generating an implicit variable. So every any variables have to be explicitly defined and to do that uh, for a real um, like floating point variables, um, we use the keyword real. And um, one will be our result, basically. By standard, it does not initialize the variables to zero. So in some older versions, it did. In, in some versions, it, it doesn't. Um, it suggested the, that um, one should initialize um, the variables and not really assume them to be in initialized to zero. So we'll start with a uh, result being zero. We will also need some sort of counter. And for that, I will make an integer k. Now we will create a loop by using the do operator. Do um, and our k will go from 1 to 1000 and do will end this loop and in this loop um, we will add 1000 terms in the way that result equals result plus 1 over k squared. Now a few things to discuss here already. So first of all one dot um, it kind of means that it's it's a real um, floating point value, not an integer variable. So that's where this uh, dot comes from. Uh, secondly, uh, k squared is um, is this double star operator. It's the um, function to get a power of a variable, so k double star 3 would be k to the power of 3, and so on and so on. In, if anybody you see, this is your POW, power function. Precedence of the operations here. So exponentiation comes first, then division, and then summation. Even though um, operations um, Algebraic operations, they are executed from left to right. 
um, they also have precedence between them. So exponentiation has the highest precedence and then uh, multiplication division lower and then summation and subtraction is the lowest. And then finally, we have the assignment uh, operation, which usually you can say it's executed from right to left, but here we only have one assignment. So uh, the new result will be equal to the old result plus the term. And um, that's all that's sufficient for our calculation for now. Let's print it out. Just print. Uh, same way as we did with hello world, but this time we will not print uh, a text rather than we'll print the variable. Um, another um, thing with it we could do, we could um, copy paste the one that uh, is computed in Mathematica. So this value, although it probably, yep, okay. And it seems to be what we wanted so far. Yes, there is a typo that I made here. Nothing serious, always comes with a typo. Yeah, so we have um, a value that we computed. So that's um, 1.6. Four three nine three four, and then the digits differ. All right. <clears throat> well, it is something, even though it's not exactly the same number. It is fairly close. Now the reason why we might get some discrepancies we will discuss in the next lectures. Uh, for now, it will suffice that we get the result close enough. And we'll try to do a few other things. For example, I could try to set a certain precision that I want to achieve. In comparison with the value um, of the limit that we already know. So let's um, add a few things. So in, in the variable section, by the way, all the variables, they should be declared on top at the start of the program, uh, on top of the code. Um, it's the way that compilers work, uh, in particularly this Fortran compiler. It wants to see all the variables up front before any other code starts. So. Uh, among the variables, though, you can put constant variables, so you can specifically tell it that it will be a constant. And the way it works, it will type real comma parameter. Mm, known, known answer. And we already have that. This is our limit. Now we know that, again, we already know that the sum converges very slowly, so we're not even expecting um, to get this exact number. Another um, parameter uh, that we can uh, set here is um, intended accuracy. And I will set it to 1,000th, so 1 over 1,000. And to enter the number like that, you can you can put 0 0.001, but you can also type 1e minus 3. This is just a notation uh, to get 1 over 1,000. So it's 10 to the exponent of negative 3. First, I will set the k to 1 up front, and then it's going to be a while loop now. So it's do while. Now in parentheses, we'll put the condition. So known answer minus the result greater than intended 
accuracy. So while um, our discrepancy is larger than 10 to the negative 3, uh, the loop will run and it will add more and more terms. Now for the terms, first of all, we should not forget to increment k. Um, but this will come after. Actually, we can do this. Let's start with 0, with k being 0. And we will increment it in the beginning. And then um, the result uh, will be the same as before. So result plus 1 over uh, k squared. This should do that. Mm, what's different now is that we don't set k specifically up front. We run the loop until a certain condition is met. Um, a certain condition regarding our accuracy. Now, if something goes wrong, I'm just saying, um, it's possible that the loop will never finish. Mm, for example, well, right now we have a fairly simple piece of code and I already tested it, it, it will complete, but it's possible to write something and make an infinite loop, for example. Or it is possible to write a loop that will never even enter into a loop because the initial condition will be uh, false. But for now, uh, while the um, initial condition is true, by the way, this expression kind of yields, it's a logical expression and it, it yields a Boolean result. So it's either true or false. Um, I think it's fairly intuitively clear how it works. Uh, from the perspective of compiler and languages, there's a lot of detail uh, because every expression produces some sort of result. So in this particular case, this is a Boolean result. Finally, let's do this. Um, we'll print the result as already done here, but we will also print um, a string that will say in intended accuracy of, um, and then our accuracy variable um, is achieved a term and then k uh, for the number of terms and it seemed to be correct. So um, <laughs> it's a very interesting coincidence here. So we'll have we have a um, um, the accuracy that we intended is achieved exactly term 1000 and it is a coincidence. Let's um, set the accuracy slightly lower and we have um, 500 terms. So indeed this works. We can also try something else. Inside the loop, let's put the print statement. Um, so what we will print, um, we will start by printing k. And uh, we will also print result. But let's introduce another um, real parameter. We'll call it term and uh, our term will be well the term that we add so term will be equal to 1 over 
Now, k right now is an integer. Let's convert it to real. So we separated the calculation of the term. Um, and then we add this here, but now we can sort of print it out. And let's see what it does. All right, so as expected, by the way, notice how fast it works. Um, printed out a lot of text in an, in an instant. Um, at around term 500, we have our value, which is 1.6 something something. And the value of the, the terms that are being added is on the, on the order of um, 10 to the minus 6. So it's, uh, it's 3 times 1 millionth. Let's see um, if we can push the accuracy a bit further. So let's say I want the accuracy to be um, 1 10,000. So 1 e minus 4. And we're going to run the code. And it seems to be running and not terminating. Mm. Although we see that these terms are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But I'm going to stop it. What you can also notice that the result doesn't change. It is called a round off error. If you're trying to add real values in the computer that have very different orders of magnitude, like 1 and... Um, 10 to the power of minus 10, or even 10 to the minus 8, um, they will not add. Uh, the bigger one will prevail and will just remain the way it is. So um, 1 plus 10 to the minus 8 will just give you 1 on, on the computer, unless you use double precision. Then In double precisions, the orders of magnitude will be different. But with the precision that we're working right now, um, even though we're trying to add those little terms, they don't really add up to this bigger number. So that's another concept to illustrate here. If you want to read about it sooner, you can read about round off error, and you can also read about representation of the floating point numbers in the computer. What we found here is, while we we're trying to make an algorithm, to compute pi square over 6, we run into the accuracy problem. So we couldn't push it beyond the accuracy of about 1000. If we're trying to make it to 10 to the power minus 4, we already have some sort of some sort of uh, numerical issues. And a big part of this course is discussing those numerical issues. Uh, as you saw in the original um, plots in Mathematica, uh, that plot is converging very slowly. So every little increment is it's, it's very small. And yes, it wasn't really a good approach to calculating pi in the first place. Well, um, let's try another uh, type of uh, series. This time it will be um, euler mascheroni number. I'm going to make a really, really quick pause right now. Um, and I will come back to you right after the pause. So welcome back to the final part of lecture two. Today's lecture is a bit, little bit long because we had some portion in the beginning um, still talking about setting up the IDE. Now we will continue with some experiments in Fortran. We're learning by example. Uh, first, I wanted to summarize 
what we're trying to achieve um, today. And uh, what we're trying to do, uh, there's some sort of learning goals or teaching goals. Uh, the goal is today learn Fortran syntax by example. So we already saw some possible numerical issues when using floating point numbers, round of error. That's a very important concept that we will continue to explore. So syntax for initializing variables and constants in Fortran. Uh, you saw syntax for loops. We use do and while statements. Uh, we printed out the results, combined some text and variables with a print operator. Uh, we talked about operator precedence. So if you have different mathematical operations or functions in the same expression, then certain operations take precedence. There is also some operations that normally execute from left to right. Uh, usually those are... And then we mention logical expressions. So the results of comparisons, uh, they result in, in Boolean value, which can be assigned to a Boolean variable if needed. So let us continue mm, with the, the, another example. We'll make it quick. Euler Mascheroni number. Somehow I made a mistake here. I already have uh, prepared a um, template for our code. Let's talk about Euler Mascheroni number real quick. It's, it is a thing. It uh, has its own article on Wikipedia. It's a constant that I discovered, I can say, independently of Euler and Mascheroni. I was playing around with numbers when I was learning calculus. It was quite a while ago. And I found this constant, it's a limit, which I noticed it has a certain value, which I immediately computed. But much to my disappointment, that number was already discovered before me um, a few centuries ago, in 1934, apparently, by Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler. It's a really big guy in, in calculus. He is for his time, he um, discovered a lot. He really added a lot to mathematics. Now, to that constant. This formulation may seem kind of scary. Let's just uh, simplify that. Uh, you probably heard about harmonic series. Mm, harmonic series, and you probably also heard that it's a divergent series. So you take a sum 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4 and so on. And this sum will diverge. You can only compute the partial sum like that. And the reason is uh, there's a very easy proof why it diverges, but you can, for any number, you can always pick a sufficient number of those terms that will be greater than that. This sequence, it's not far off from a logarithm function because logarithm, it's an integral of one over x. And uh, this is a sum of one over n. So those are very similar. It turns out that the difference is has a limit. The, the difference for n going to infinity, uh, there's a certain limit that this difference achieves. So I prepared a few plots in Mathematica. So one would be uh, the harmonic series. And it has those little steps. At every integer, it goes up by one small step. And the second plot is the one of the logarithm. And we can combine them to show that the difference seem to be approaching a constant as those two functions go, they just keep going together. And let's take the um, let's take the difference and plot uh, 
ranging from one to 100 terms. And indeed, it seems to converge um, again at the same number. So without too much discussion, um, Mathematica even has this number programmed in it that they call Euler Gamma. And its value is 0 0.5772156 and so on. Uh, in comparison with the previous series that we worked with, this one converges much faster. Each term uh, is quite substantial. This will allow us to play around with them a little bit uh, better uh, because each has something to add to the function. So let's see, um, let's see how many um, how many significant digits we can compute. That's another term, by the way, if you haven't read about significant digits, you need to know what these are. So check out Wikipedia for um, the meaning of uh, significant digits and so on. So we're going to write um, a small code to compute Euler Mascheroni number for a given number of terms. Mm. So as before, we'll have an integer constant. We'll call it n terms. And we'll start with 1000. We'll have the um, mm, real result as before, which will start from zero. We will need a, a loop. And we'll also need an integer uh, for that loop. Now, we, we don't in initialize that k because it's initialized in the loop. So it goes from one to the number of terms that we um, add together. And as before, result will be result plus that term. And for now, that's, that's all we're going to do. Let's print out the result. And let's also print out the difference. Now the difference um, will be the value that we know up front. Well, let's call it EM. By the way, um, Fortran is not a case sensitive language in terms that any um, variable names, any keywords, um, Fortran will not care about the letter case, except for the um, text strings, the one you print out. Mm, I'm just going to copy paste that from Mathematica. You, in reality, you only need um, about eight digits, um, anything more, and it will not even fit. Um, and we'll uh, calculate the difference between the constant that we know and the result that we calculated. Let's run. That's not a very good um, result because in the end we need to sub subtract the logarithm. Now there are a number of um, elementary functions already available in Fortran, such as log, 
some trigonometric functions. Um, you've already seen exponentiation as the double star operator. Um, we'll talk about those functions more uh, just later on. For now, there is log. Uh, we'll just use it. And um, let's try this. Yeah, and of course, log wants a real um, value rather than an integer. Uh, there is a special operator, real, which will convert our integer into a real value. And there it is. Actually, we are not too far off from the proper um, result. So we got um, three digits correctly. Uh, let's increase the number of terms by an order of magnitude and explore. And we're getting closer every time. Um, remember, um, last time with, with basal function, uh, when we added 10,000 terms, we already got into the situation where the new terms did not make any difference. In this case, let's make a uh, hundred thousand and compute. It's a good thing that uh, Fortran is it's a compiled um, language. The result works very fast, so we just added up ten thousand numbers, and it seems that we actually reached. We have reached the limit here because it does not improve the accuracy anymore. So we'll leave it like this. Um, this is the end of lecture two. I know it's been a long lecture uh, today. Um, it was a fairly quick jump into Fortran. The goal is so that you can get used to the syntax. Next lecture will compute more. <laughs> Stay tuned. We will finally talk a little bit about the history of Fortran and we'll look at Fortran 77, how it used those punch cards and, and such.